uh, I think we all know. Recording also. is on. Okay, so Derek started recording. I think so. So this is an information. So has Derek wanted to record the session for people who can't attend? If there is someone that doesn't want to have uh, the face recorded, just switch on the camera. And that's the general information. So um, as you might know, Derek is from the from my department, actually. We are from the same place, uh, from the Human Center Design Department. It's the new name, if, is, uh, if I'm correct. Uh, in the Faculty of Industrial Design Engineering, doing research and teaching also on uh, AI for well-being. Uh, that's correct, right? And uh, he's going to show us some uh, um, projects and uh, research on how to uh, design meaningful uh, AI that is meaningful for people and also uh, trigger some reflections on uh, controversial aspects of it. And I would say I just leave the stage to you, Derek, so you can say more. Great. Thank you. Uh, I will start my screen sharing and you can see yeah okay great uh yeah thank you so much for the invite uh, and the intro um this is a topic i care a lot about um uh, when i came to delft my interests were around uh data-driven system design and uh figuring out what we want to be optimizing in those systems. Um, I was a little reluctant to attach to the label of AI just because the artificiality seems to exclude humans. Um, but you know, it's the uh, it's a big tent, and I'll I'll, I'll be talking about that. Um, so in this presentation, I'll, I'll give a. a brief intro and then share a bit of my uh, design and research journey. Um, I'll share not quite a design framework, but a, a towards a design framework for AI for well-being, and definitely open to uh, comments and feedback as I develop this. Um, and there are a bunch of design examples that uh, will hopefully be useful for discussion, and we'll see where that leads us. Um, so. We're right at the beginning of all this. Um, you know, we've been, you know, this is what, since the late 40s, one, one can argue, it's cybernetics. Um, but if the world doesn't collapse, which it seems like it is, um, you know, another 50 years, we're going to have uh, some pretty powerful systems out there. And there's really a concern about how this is going to play out, uh, the, the power of these systems, whether they're actually going to enhance our humanity uh, or degrade it. So um, you, you might be familiar with some of the work that's been going on in ethical AI. Um, just to summarize this real quick, a um, uh, great recent paper by uh, Floridi looked at some 47 different principles of ethical AI and distilled it down into five. Uh, basically, it should be good and it shouldn't be bad. It should support human control, it should account for bias, and it should be explainable. Um, but even within this, it doesn't really get at what it should be optimizing for. And that's something that I think is, uh, is really critical. Uh, it's partially in the be good part but um, it's, it's hard to operationalize. Uh, so you know, we need to have AI systems that don't uh, dehumanize us, that are good for our well-being. And one of the big issues is that intelligent systems, uh, by their nature, optimize numerical metrics. Uh, but some of those metrics are more accessible, like GDP or click-through rates than, than others, like human well-being, which is harder to measure, especially in real time, and it's hard to get a lot of data from it. So uh, Don Norman sent this out yesterday, so I thought it was uh, relevant. This is in the context of the dumpster fire that is the United States of America at the moment. 
And um, he's saying that, you know, we need to work together, build a long-term future. Um, there are major issues around the world in terms of hunger, poverty, racial prejudice. And then he said, we need to get rid of the GDP as a measure of success and replace it with measures of wellness and satisfaction. So um, that's, that's great, Don. I, I really appreciate that. That sort of sets things up here. Uh, Don uh, was my postdoc advisor, and uh, he wrote the book, Design of Everyday Things. Um, and this notion of shifting from GDP as a measure of success is, is interesting and challenging. So um, the, the main design challenge, as I see it, is to design these well-being metrics, these metrics for good, uh, in a sense that they are accessible to AI systems. And to do that, we need to translate our humanistic felt values into numbers. And that is a tricky and fraught task. So this is something that um, is economically important. So Mark Zuckerberg, a couple of years ago, um, was making some changes to the news feed that were going to reduce revenues and wanted to prepare investors for that, uh, saying that we feel a responsibility to make sure our services aren't just fun to use, but also good for people's well-being. And so I think we can all agree that we can leave it to Mark Zuckerberg and he will figure this all out. That's a joke um, because Facebook right now is a serious threat to uh, the stability of society. I think one can very reasonably argue he has not figured this out, um, but it is important. And even from a self-interested perspective of a business, um, you can make some short-term revenue gains, but if you're really doing something that's bad for people, bad for society, uh, that is a long-term risk. So just to do some level setting, um, examples of AI, usually this is best approached from examples. So we've got the FANG here, we've got the Facebook feed, Amazon recommendations, Netflix Q, Google search, uh, any online ad that you see, Anytime you make a purchase, the sort of frog detection algorithms that are taking place, facial recognition, voice to text. Autopilot, I think, is a great example of AI uh, because it was invented in 1914. So um, that's, that's a good example. Uh, oh, and then this is, uh, this is a piece that sold recently. The, the AI art market is still fairly small, but you know, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Um, so, Oftentimes people try not to go too far into the definitions of intelligence, but I really like Peter Norvig, uh, research director at Google's definition. So he says, the ability to select an action that is expected to maximize a performance measure. Um, it's a little bit arcane, but the basic idea is that to act intelligent, you need to measure outcomes. Uh, you know, Everything in that sense is quantifiable, but even from a human intelligence perspective, Robert Sternberg also talks about uh, success intelligence that essentially, you know, stupid is as stupid does and smart is as smart does. Um, if you're doing something that's uh, adding to the success of your system, then that's, that's a smart move. Um, and, you know, being able to have a measure of your success is, is critical for this. And so those measures of success and the optimization of those measures, that's really at the heart of intelligence. Now, I like to take things back, um, you know, to cybernetics. I think cybernetics is a, a much more coherent design perspective than artificial intelligence. Um, you know, conceptually, theoretically. Uh, and, you know, this is from Norbert Wiener's uh, 1948 uh, perspective on perception action feedback loops. Um, this is applicable not just to digital or artificial systems, which is why I like it so much. It, it's a general theory of, of governance in systems, including biological systems. Um, it's extendable to uh, business systems, 
I like the notion of a continuous improvement loop. I think it's a very helpful framework for, um, for designers that you want to assess and adapt. So you're looking for ways of uh, measuring outcomes and then uh, modifying your designs in response to those measures, or maybe more humanly, you want to identify areas of need and then you want to do something about it. And so this, this means that even the design of a chair can be uh, set up as a cybernetic system if you are gathering feedback on the outcomes um, and making modifications in, in response. So this is very gen generalizable, but it's also, I think, quite specific. And so I like it. We wrote a paper about this recently uh, for TMCE, uh, Designing Smart Systems, Reframing Artificial Intelligence for Human-Centered Designers. Um, so uh, just to tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from. So uh, when I started my PhD at Carnegie Mellon in the Human Computer Interaction Institute, I had just gotten into game design um, for learning and looking at the potential of using low cost computers um, and creating software for low cost computers that could have a, a, an impact in developing countries, um, looking at how to scale digital education by making it engaging and effective. And the engagement part was so critical. I was really excited about the science of fun. Um, yeah, I wanted to be a phonologist. I am a phonologist. Uh, and wanting to combine that with learning science and AI. And my notion of phonology at the time, it was, it was a sort of, I was imagining um, all these sensors, EEG, posture sensors, all these different ways of uh, measuring fun. How do, we, how do we measure fun? Because that's what we're trying to, to optimize. And um, you know, we had these games, uh, like this battleship number line game, you're trying to blow up uh, these targets on a number line. You know, you're given a, um, a fraction and you've got to find this hidden submarine. Um, made all kinds of different games for mathematics, uh, released them on uh, app stores and, and online. Ended up making some 40, 45 different games uh, on different platforms. And you know, big question around all of them was, was whether they were working. Um, and how did we measure whether they were fun? And I, I came to learn about uh, A-B testing in online products. Um, so this is, some, some estimates are that there's over 10,000 a day run by the, the big tech companies where they'll take different design variations and randomly assign them to users and see which design has the best effects on the outcomes. And those uh, evaluation criteria, that the outcomes, they could be anything from uh, revenue to uh, click-through rates, wh whatever is available. And I thought it was a little bit sad that there was so much technology and, and effort put into improving online advertisements instead of improving educational outcomes. Um, and what I, what I found was that in my desire to measure fun, it, it didn't take all those sensors. Really all it took was uh, a measure of how long people were voluntarily playing. So this measure of engagement, which was really what we wanted um, in the first place with these educational games. We wanted students to be voluntarily engaging in these games and playing them. Uh, this was a great measure of, of motivation um, and uh, a great measure of fun. And so Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, he's, he's famous for his flow theory. Um, he has a particular notion that when your abilities and a, a challenge in your environment are balanced, uh, then you can achieve flow. And so the, the implication here is that things shouldn't be too easy or you get bored or too hard or you get anxious, but when they're just, when there's just enough challenge, um, you enjoy it. And so, yeah, not, not too hard, not too easy. So we had this 
hypothesis that in our games, if we had a moderate level of difficulty, we'd have the maximum motivation that kids playing our games, because we'd, we'd get a few thousand uh, players every day, um, that if we uh, randomly assign people to different levels of difficulty, then somewhere in the middle, we would find that optimal difficulty where we'd have maximal motivation, uh, maximum fun. And so this is uh, this is the 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 game, the this battleship number line game. Um, you're either typing in a, a fraction or you're clicking um, uh, at where you think a fraction is. And this is how it looked like back then. So you type in, boo, and uh, or you click. Yeah. Okay, so really simple game. Um, yeah, again, this is what it looks like now, and we're running these experiments again. Um, we actually were collaborating on an open source A-B testing platform uh, that's funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the uh, Eric Schmidt uh, Futures Fund. So this is a, a A-B testing platform for educational software. It's called Upgrade, so that's a current project that I'm working on. Um, so back then, to create these different variations of game difficulty, we varied different design factors. So if, if we made the target bigger, uh, it would be easier to hit. Uh, if we made the time limit longer, um, there's a better chance that they could uh, answer successfully. And certain items were easier than others. And so uh, we ran the super experiment with um, yeah, 13,000 different variations, a two by nine by eight by six by four by four factorial um, with about 70,000 players and uh, to, to test this hypothesis. So th this was creating all these different variations in difficulty. And the, the idea was is that uh, um, according to this theory that, that moderate difficulty, we should have maximum motivation. What we found was that uh, when we, when we created a model of the difficulty of all these different factors, uh, pretty much the harder we made the game, uh, the uh, less time people played. And the easier we made it, the more time people played. Um, and so this was a bit of a shock. Um, we, we ran a number of different follow-up experiments. We did find that novelty worked really well. So when we balanced the amount of novelty in the game, that produced this sort of inverted U-shaped curve. And so we, we said, okay, well, it's not, not too hard, not too easy, but uh, not too hard, not too boring. People like things to be easy if it's new. Um, they like to succeed. Um, but so all of, all of this is, is just this way in which we can uh, use the scale of experimentation to both directly improve the, the software, but also to improve the theory underlying the software. So, um, you know, we use learning theory to design these games, we bring them to millions of users, and then we can run these experiments, which either have a direct applied outcome, um, sort of like a normal A-B test, uh, or we can generate new theory like uh, this idea that it's uh, not too hard, not too boring. And this is, this is something that is, is generalizable beyond uh, education, um, just that we can use theory to inform designs, and then when they're at scale, we can run these different types of experiments um, to create generalizable theories about the effects of uh, designs. And so, you know, we had about 5,000 players, subjects a day, and we were able to run thousands of these experiments every year, but it's, it's difficult to set them all up. Um, and so we started thinking about this AI-assisted science of motivation. And so that's a good point to pause. If you know um, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century um, or uh, uh, Sapiens, um, uh, Homo Deus, uh, Yuval Noah Harari has been talking a lot about the risk of 
hacking human beings. So when we have theory and practices that understand how we operate better than we do ourselves, um, you know, when some other actor can kind of predict how we're going to act, um, they're able to manipulate us. Uh, so it's against our interests. Now, of course, in our case, we're trying to do this in the service of education, but that's probably not uh, the intention behind uh, many of these experiments that are that are taking place. So this is a, a pretty serious risk. Um, but this this was uh, our effort to embed um, this automated scientific experimentation at scale, a uh, paper called uh, Interface Design Optimization as a Multi-Arm Bandit Problem. Um, and the idea was that we've got this feedback loop where the online game is used by the thousands of players and then we use machine learning, um, sort of simple reinforcement learning algorithm, this multi-arm bandit um, approach to search the design space and figure out which design improvements are most effective and automatically increase game engagement. And so this, this actually worked. Um, it, it worked pretty well, uh, but we started getting these phone calls that there was a bug in the game. And when we checked out what the algorithm had done, um, it, it made the game something that was no longer uh, having any real educational value. So all it did was just dramatically increase the size of the targets um, and it decided that that was what was generating the most engagement. And the problem for us was that, yes, we were trying to increase engagement, but we were also trying to um, improve uh, the, the learning outcomes. And that wasn't incorporated in our, uh, in our metric, uh, in our optimization metric. And so this showed that it's really quite easy for AI to optimize for the wrong thing. Um, it also showed that it was a little bit silly that we just tried to create a closed loop system that excluded uh, people, designers. Um, it wasn't just, like we had a dashboard, we were able to kind of monitor this. So, so I suppose technically there was a human in the loop insofar as we could look at the numbers, but there wasn't a human in the loop in terms of monitoring the experience of what was being optimized. And so that's that's something that's really pretty important is um, making sure there's a bridge between that experience, uh, that felt experience and the quantitative optimization. And then finally, that there really is this need for a continuous alignment between the objects of optimization um, and the underlying values that uh, are behind the system. So um, this comes to this design framework that, that I'm working on around AI for well-being. So uh, Delft has been really a, a center for... That is mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Sorry, maybe we can address one question that was in the chat, if it's still, Absolutely. or maybe it was answered already. Jared, what do you... Uh, because I think it's a nice, uh, now we move into the framework and I thought it was a nice moment to, if someone has questions. Um, so, uh, no, when you were talking about it, I was noting like you were making the jump from, oh, it's an education program, fun equals engagement equals motivation equals playing time. And I was like worried that you were going to optimize playing time and run into problems but that was precisely the point you were making. So no, it's not a question anymore. You already answered it. Yeah, yeah. I kind of set myself up there. Uh, yes. So you're thinking about exactly the right things. Um, yeah, feel free. Uh, throw more questions in as we go. And then whenever I come to a pause, uh, I can address them. Yeah, there is Evgeny that would like to ask a question, I think. Uh, yes. Thanks. Uh, Derek, I'd like to ask a question about uh, <clears throat> so one of the introductory slides that you uh, gave, where you talked about the definition, well, one definition of intelligence. So that uh, that definition that seemed to really focus um, 
and you 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 came back to this point several times the idea of maximizing a quantifiable success uh and this is so so i'd like to to just to to uh discuss this a bit more but well hear your thoughts in more detail about this because um it seems to me that uh there are many uh, uh situations where uh we are not able to um you know put in a quantifiable measure such a thing as well-being uh and when we talk about intelligence uh if, if we talk very narrowly about intelligence as uh, focusing on this kind of aspect we may be missing out uh many many other um dimensions of what it means to different people uh in society in a given context of what uh what well-being means maybe maybe you will be addressing this in the in the uh, in the remaining part of your presentation but i'd like to hear your thoughts on this thank you yeah i'd say that that is really the story of the presentation um and so i think that this would be a really good question to return to at the at the end because it's um it's really central to uh the challenge i think sure sounds good yeah Yeah, you not wanted to ask a question, I think. Yes. And also Derek. Yes, uh, Derek. Thanks uh, so far. Um, the example that you ended with, uh, where the game optimized something that you really did not want to optimize, is I think a typical example of what they call an AI uh, reward hacking, right? So you have a reward function, and you you optimize the heck out of it, and you get something that was not the intention. So I was trying to understand your last slide. What are you saying? Are you saying we should keep uh, optimizing the uh, the reward functions and and try to get closer and closer to what we really want, or do you say, well, this is an impossible task? Maybe even as you said in the in the beginning, not only a tricky but a fraught uh, task, and we should never get the human out of the loop to make it a little bit black and white. So, so where are you in? Uh, yeah, so I would break apart the, the, the option that you gave there. So I, I, do, I think it's really important that we try um, and that we don't uh, give up the, the effort to quantify some of our most deeply head, held values, mm -hmm. even though it is um, a serious risk. Um, and it's part of why I think it's really important to do this work in an academic context. Um, because it, you know, the, I, I can imagine mm, there being proofs that this is a bad idea. Um, but I, I don't think we'll get there until we try. And what I'm more concerned about is that if we abandon the effort to measure what we treasure, um, the systems for optimization are so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, that they will be used on values that we uh, don't care about as much. And just an example here is something like test scores in education um, and well-being in education. So we measure test scores. We don't measure well-being. Um, and well-being is an input to education, but it's also an output of education. And by because we don't measure uh, well-being, it's almost invisible to uh, large institutions. So large institutions are unable to take um, institutional action to improve well-being um, without uh, measures and awareness. Um, or at least that's that's an argument that I'd make. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point, if I may, uh, because this is not necessarily tied to artificial intelligence, machine learning, or any recent advance of technology. This is a bit, this is, has been a problem of society for a much longer time. We quantify stuff, and we know that we're limited to that, like your GDP example. But hey, there's nothing else, so we'll live with it, and we have a certain um, resilience to the interpretation of that number, you would hope. And a resistance to uh, reducing deeply held values to just numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, I definitely sympathize with people that um, have had a lot of really nice arguments with people about 
whether we should be measuring at all um, these things that we value mm -hmm. and uh, what the alternatives are. And from my, you know, again, my perspective is that it would be dangerous to not try. And I think that the solution is um, not just having humans in the loop, but having this continuous alignment methodology. Um, so really moving away from autonomous systems. I think autonomous systems are an illusion. Um, and I think they are, um, it, I, I, yeah, I, I feel, I'd, I'd be interested in, in counter examples, but um, I think that they are such a profound illusion that they cause a conceptual uh, barrier to the proper involvement of people simply because it's interesting that things can be done without people, um, even though um, you know the, the the involvement of people can make the system work better. So th that's why I, I put the you know instead of saying we're going for artificial intelligence here, no, no, we're going for smart systems. Uh, if the involvement of people and algorithms make the system work better, that's always preferable to a purely autonomous system. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Derek. I think uh, time for the next question. Yeah, there is David with a complex question, or at least it's long in the chat. Yes. So uh, thanks a lot for the for the talk so far, <clears throat> and my uh, my question is about uh, your connection uh, to uh, Flow uh, from uh, Cheeks and Mihai. And so, in my understanding, Flow is a dynamic emergent property. And it seemed that um, your hypothesis was based on the assumption that humans would stay static, but perhaps I misunderstood. Uh, and so my question was, uh, it seemed your machine learning example actually put some dynamics in, uh, in, in making the game more difficult, perhaps as people progressed. And so um, I was wondering if there would be a different, let's say, underlying hypothesis for the, the the change in task difficulty and, and all these uh, um, these elements of your game. Yeah. It's more related yeah. to, to, uh, to the dynamics. Yeah, so I, I didn't include a lot of this um, background, but part of what I was responding to was a study done by Csikszentmihalyi um, very recently that, that tested this hypothesis about moderate difficulty and um, enjoyment with chess games and showed this very clear inverted U-shaped curve. And um, my, um, my conclusion out of all of this is um, that difficulty is not the same as challenge, actually. So difficulty as defined by, as the uh, probability of failure is not uh, actually what he means by challenge, going back and looking at what he's exactly. written in past work. Um, and that challenge actually has a lot more to do with novelty and suspense um, and, uh, and choice even than difficulty. Um, and so uh, that's one piece. I also don't really buy this balanced approach uh, as a design method. Um, my current reading of Csikszentmihalyi and sort of hypothesis around flow, which is a beautiful concept. I mean, it's a really beautiful concept. And mm, I share your reluctance to simplify it into the, you know, just difficulty. Um, I view flow as whole mindedness. Um, so when it is the only thing occupying your attention, and um, behavior, um, that, that is really the underlying nature of, uh, of the flow state when everything is harmoniously coherent. Um, and you know, Csikszentmihalyi talks about that actually extensively, but I think 
part of the value of his model with regards to uh, challenge and ability is that it's more measurable. And at the very end of the presentation that I probably won't have time to get to, um, I talk about uh, how, well, one, one approach for how we might be able to measure that um, deep uh, engagement um, with, the, with the EG and, and some work that I'm, I'm doing uh, around that. But yeah, whole I have a suggestion. is, is what, I, what I would uh, position as the core theory of flow. I have a suggestion from personal experience. You have to measure the amount of time between that you need to go to the bathroom and actually going to the bathroom. Thank you. What's that? Yeah. What the hell is that, David? Say again. <laughs> yeah, excellent, excellent. I like that. <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, I'll um I'll keep going, but keep throwing in uh, uh, questions and um. So here's this, this basic design framework. So Delta has been a, a great place. Uh, Peter Desmond and Anna Pohlmeyer have um, uh, been promoting and developing this theory of positive de design that combines a design for virtue, design for pleasure, and design for personal significance um, as a, a designerly approach for well-being. Um, they primarily use this PERMA model of well-being, but they're pretty open uh, to the various measures and, and models of well-being. Um, and, you know, in addition to positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment, there are obvious things like physical health um, that include factors like sleep, nutrition, and exercise, and mental health. Um, there are many factors that affect well-being. Um, one of the interesting notions about well-being is how uh, amazingly unitary of a concept it becomes, uh, of a construct it becomes, um, in terms of subjective well-being. Because when you feel good, uh, that is really the heart of it. Uh, and of course, there are things you can do that can make you feel good momentarily, but not in the longer term. And that's that's the whole challenge of, of human life in a way. Um, but it is incredible how much um, gets uh, integrated into this singular notion of, of feeling good. Um, so uh, again, uh, this idea of cybernetic loops and smart systems, the algorithm for AI for well-being is that we need to assess well-being needs and do something in response. Um, it's not that complicated. It doesn't necessarily involve machine learning at all, um, but it does involve the assessment of well-being. And this is, uh, you'll see this in a number of uh, subsequent examples, a place that I think design and human-centered design have a, uh, a real role to play. Um, as an aside, uh, I'm doing some work now uh, with Freddie Ubersher um, on the role of human-centered design in AI system uh, production, uh, which I think is, there, there are a lot of roles for human-centered designers in AI, um, not just the development of measures. There, there, there are a lot of different places where human-centered design plays a role, and that's, that's a topic for another talk. Um, but this uh, towards a framework. Uh, so first of all, that uh, human intelligence needs to be welcome in uh, these AI systems or smart systems for well-being. It cannot be something that is uh, a kind of gadget-oriented approach. Um, it needs to be involving human decision making and human awareness. Um, and. I'll give some examples of how I think that contributes to the efficiency of the systems and uh, you know how to how to humanize the the AI because an an inhuman AI future is <laughs> just doesn't sound right. Um, so another part of this framework is uh, this idea that smart systems are subsystems. I really, really think it's important to to recognize that we're always designing subsystems 
or never making an autonomous system. It's always part of something else. And therefore we need to think about those interfaces. Um, uh, in general, we want to be focusing on improving measures, but we should be looking at diverse measures of well-being. Uh, and a key idea that I think is the, the best to um, articulate in this talk is how to combine metrics with designerly vision. And Paul Heckert uh, uh, wrote the book on uh, vision and product design, and it's largely his notion of vision that I'm referring to here. But what I see is a productive tension between the qualitative and the quantitative, the felt experience and the measurable. Um, these are not choices. These are uh, two approaches to the world that um, it goes back to some of the earliest uh, philosophy, the Pythagorean idea of uh, numerical harmonies in the cosmos. Uh, but this, this idea that there is a tension between these approaches and that uh, that tension is productive. So when I teach uh, design students, I often have them develop measurable goals, you know, smart goals, right? You want to have goals that are very clear and measurable. Um, but uh, you want to supplement that with a vision that is um, that is felt, that is metaphorical, that is giving the sense uh, of feeling that you're going for, not just the the defined um, operationalized goal. And when you have those both together, um, they work with each other. And this is, uh, this is an approach that I think is um, useful in, in any kind of design process and is, is really critical for um, an, an AI system uh, that will, by definition, have these defined operationalized goals. Um, but having the vision um, and developing strong visions of, of what that future is that we want to live in uh, I think is is critical. Uh, so now I'm going to give some examples, but I can take a moment if there are any questions. Jared wants to ask a question, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, it's it's might be a small question. So I'm wondering which of the following two questions or another one you are trying to optimize. Are you looking for a good metric for good AI, or are you? trying to find out how we should use such a metric. So uh, I have a feeling that's two different questions I hear in your story, and I'm not sure which of the two you're most on. Well, I think it's the former, um, but I think the former implies the, the, the latter. Um, so, you know, yes, what, how do we want to uh, think about you know, so Facebook, take Facebook. They want to improve uh, user well-being with their news feed. How, how do they measure that? How, how do they know whether what they're doing is working? How can they approach that problem in a tractable way? Um, and when they have found something, how should they go about responding to it? I think those are part of the same uh, effort. Um, I'm not convinced yet, but I'll wait until you've given more examples to throw more questions about that to you. Yeah, great, and and please do. That's a, a, a good mm, point of, of clarity that I'd, I'd like to uh, address. So uh, yeah, any other questions before I go on to these examples? I didn't see hands. Okay, me... great. Yeah. So most recently, um, the notion of well-being has come up quite strongly in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so we've produced and released a new system called My Wellness Check. That's uh, an open science project to understand human well-being at scale and over time. Um, the pandemic has produced a, a lot of effects on um, our economy, a lot of effects on individual and social health, um, and a lot of effects on mental health. 
And so in trying to understand how the lockdowns and, and other actions are affecting people's well-being, uh, we wanted to figure out, well, what's a, what's a better way of measuring it? How, how can we use human-centered design to um, understand uh, what people are going through and you know, what their needs are? And um, how can we responsively uh, assess and, and, and from there think about what we can do about it? So this is um, eventually trying to produce Mm, this complete cybernetic loop, but the emphasis for now is on using design to improve the assessment of well-being over time. And so uh, this uh, mywellnesscheck.org, this is uh, our website. I encourage you to sign up. Um, you'll receive uh, messages via uh, email or uh, SMS that uh, ask you to fill in a short assessment of well-being, and um, the the idea is how, how could we come up with a sort of weather report to understand how well-being is uh, affected and, and changing over time. So these are just some uh, uh, example screens that people have. We're asking people about their energy level. We're having them fill in emojis that represent some of the, the feelings that they've had recently and, and really trying to be innovative around the types of uh, measures and assessment while still including standardized uh, validated measures, um, all while keeping things as short as possible. So uh, in the past month, after, after a month we had uh, just over a thousand uh, total responses, and one thing that was uh, quite interesting that one of, one of the most common measures of um, cognitive well-being is uh, life satisfaction, and you can see this bimodal distribution popping up where there are a number of people that are really they're they're struggling. They are they are dissatisfied, um, and you can see some of the recent behaviors. People are having a hard time exercising, sleeping, not so hard of a time eating. Um, and uh, these are just some of the other questions. Um, and then the qualitative data that's come out has you know, by far been the most interesting part. Um, so we've, we've gathered a lot of this and being able to see um, how are people, for instance, with uh, financial challenges, um, with low well-being affected differently from those without financial challenges, you know, that are also struggling? Um, so here are just some, some quotes. Uh, one in the, the, the middle is a person who's um, doing well. Um, they've they feel like they've uh, been doing better since the lockdowns. Um, and th these are just representative quotes. Um, so this this project continues. We've now, uh, yesterday we had to redesign uh, pretty much all the messaging because of the uh, protests uh, in the States. Uh, some of the emphasis on COVID-19 alone has started to sound a little tone deaf. And so we needed to adapt um, the, the messaging and the questions to try to capture um, yeah, how, how people are, are feeling without trying to focus it too much on the, uh, the, the sort of political situation. Um, but you know, when there are riots in uh, dozens of, of cities across the states, uh, people aren't doing well. Um, it's a pretty clear sign. And again, this comes back to some of the uh, orientations of um, you know, replacing GDP. Um, this isn't a technology, there, there are some technology challenges in that. I mean, if, if we want to better uh, assess well being, if we wanted to improve well being, address people's needs in a, a more systematic way as opposed to just grow the economy. Um, there are real technical challenges with that, but it's not just a technology issue. I mean, it's a, it's a policy issue, um, and that's something that uh, is a 
philosophy issue. Um, and these are things that we can't help but engage with. Um, we, we need to engage with as, as designers and, and human beings. Um, it's not always going to be at this uh, social level, but even in the context of a company um, that's, you know, setting up new metrics for optimization, um, the question of, of what those goals are and how those metrics represent those goals, this is, this is something that I'm trying to prepare designers to be able to dialogue with. I think they need to have the, the you know, some basic data science skills and they need to have some basic uh, rhetorical skills to, to engage these um, political and philosophical questions. Um, so now I'm gonna go through a set of uh, design examples from students. So this is uh, an ITD project that used um, a night light that would respond to a child's mood uh, as represented by these different cats. Um, and uh, it was also tracking the button pushes over time and saving them in an app. And the idea was um, to help families talk about emotions and keep track of uh, difficult emotions and, and support social emotional learning. It's a cool project. Um, this is, uh, and in this project, you'll notice there's no optimization in the system. The system is providing measurement, but any sort of optimization is only on the human side. In contrast, this Good Vibes project, uh, a smart blanket to help insomniacs fall asleep faster, um, this um, uses vibrotactile vibrations that uh, are embedded in a, a weighted blanket. You get this kind of body scanning up and down your, your body. It just feels nice, you can sort of zone out. And um, the intention of this is to um, have it be based on some physiological signals and so have a closed loop. Uh, here we don't, re you know, we can involve people, um, but you don't really want to be controlling it on your phone while you're trying to fall asleep. And so this is a much more appropriate place for an, you know, automated system because you're you're trying to fall asleep. And when you do fall asleep, it should probably turn off. Those those sorts of decisions. So this is in contrast where the uh, algorithmic optimization, um, you know, should be in the system and not relying on, on the people. Um, this is uh, another system like this uh, that uses the Muse uh, EEG, four channel EEG to measure the individual peak alpha frequency of uh, uh, a person's brain waves. So mostly in the visual cortex, you, you can, the, the alpha frequency is the dominant frequency and Individuals have different alpha peak frequencies that range from you know eight to twelve hertz. Um, this varies between individuals and over time. And the hypothesis is this has not been tested um, is that by flickering lights at those frequencies or at uh, offsets of those frequencies will be able to disrupt the rumination loops that are associated with depression and burnout, the kind of repetitive strings of, of negative thoughts. Um, this is an example of trying to combine artificial intelligence and human intelligence. So it uses adaptive learning algorithms uh, to keep track of math facts that a student has mastered and the ones that they struggle with and to provide those to parents so that the parent holds the phone and asks the question of their child, the algorithm determines what is the next question to answer. Um, and this is able to leverage the you know, parent's ability to intuit their child's emotion and support their motivation. Um, and so this is this AI human teamwork approach that is Again, just another example of involving humans and AI and smart systems. 
Uh, Zensys was uh, the original implementation of the My Wellness check, but focused on a healthcare setting. Um, my uh, uh, my my father uh, had cancer this past year. He passed away, um, and in the year that he was on chemo, uh, I was just. I was a little bummed that the medical system that was extremely expensive and super high tech um, didn't really seem to be very interested in the other aspects of his well-being as a patient, uh, even on the aspects that would uh, affect outcomes, like you know getting exercise, um, you know uh, eating, sleeping. Um, they just weren't tracking this sort of thing. And other aspects of well-being, like, uh, you know, are you talking to, um, or are you doing things for fun? These, these are both inputs to medical treatment, but they're also outputs. I mean, that's the point of the medicine, is that you can have well-being. And that is somehow a little bit divorced from the system today. Uh, and so this is just a, an approach for making it easier for doctors or hospitals to prescribe uh, remote wellness checks. Um, NeuroUX is a company um, that uh, started a couple of years ago uh, with a psychiatrist at UC San Diego. Uh, we produce these mobile cognitive assessment uh, tasks that um, are used by different psychiatric researchers to assess working memory and ambition control, uh, as well as these ecological momentary um, assessments of you know, what people are doing, um, different aspects of their behavior, um, attitudes, etc. And so the, the, the basic idea is how do we get more data into psychiatry so that uh, treatments can be better um, researched and uh, supported. Uh, this is a graduation project with uh, 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 Gerd uh, Kortem and uh, Jackie Bourgeois uh, with uh, Song Sheng Liu. Um, and the idea was to embed sensors in a wheelchair that could identify behaviors associated with well-being, like posture and uh, and different exercises, um, and then a, an app to motivate those behaviors. So it was it was a really nice project because um, uh, it was a clear, it, it had a very clear approach to the data collection and the alignment of of measures with the, these underlying goals, uh, and it worked pretty well. Um, and uh, Cinepal, this is a graduation project done with uh, Paul Heckert and uh, uh, Matthijs uh, uh, Hybrix. I should know how to pronounce his last name, but apologies. Um, so this was in response to the challenges observed with Netflix and other kind of modern entertainment systems that are more or less trying to hack us into consuming you know, uh, spending as much of our attention there as possible. So he looked at, well, what would an AI streaming service look like if it were designed to contribute to individual well-being? Um, and there was this whole notion of how, how can the system better understand a person's intentions so that they can be supported? Um, you know, intentions, everything from, you know, how many episodes of Breaking Bad do I really want to watch? Um, ahead of time, uh, to what kinds of feelings do I want from my media consumption and uh, using a, a kind of data collection and discovery process to inform uh, the streaming service. Uh, this is a really beautiful project that uh, was a rare graduation project that was uh, launched the day of graduation. So this is available for sale today, uh, Envision Glasses with the TU Delft startup uh, Envision. This is a Furcon uh, Metin. And it was uh, an application of uh, Google's uh, smart glasses for uh, the visually impaired. And 
the key insight here was how to use human involvement when the AI computer vision breaks down, which of course it inevitably does. And to allow a person within the interface to very easily uh, call a friend or a, uh, a volunteer or paid worker on uh, several different platforms for the blind. And it works and it's, it was a really well done project. Uh, Independence. So I'm just going to show this video real quick. Dictionary defines it as the ability to live your life without being helped or influenced by others. It could also mean the ability to discover a whole new recipe. Chicken and pumpkin soup. Soup ingredients. It could mean submitting an assignment just before the deadline. It could be sharing a laugh with a colleague near the coffee machine. Looks like Alex from finance. To step out for some fresh air and roam the streets without any worry. Looks like a body of water running through a grassy field. Or just managing to catch that train during rush hour. 1541, Sprinter, Amsterdam Central, via Maria Hall. To be able to sort and read my own letters. Credit card statement, post box 289. To be able to pop quickly into my favorite local store. Mango chutney. It is to know that when I get stuck, I have people to call upon. Hey, Yishin, where are you? Hey there, um, there seems to be a roadblock here. Can you help me out? I can help you out. Uh, do you want to use like a road map or something? Okay, wait, I'll share my location. All hands meeting. Tulip three meeting room. Tulip three. Happy to be surrounded by great people and be surprised by their love. Looks like a birthday cake with lit candles. To cook my favorite meal that my lovely family can't get enough of. To push my physical limits. To move, to jump, to punch, and to feel alive. I wish you the happiest year ahead. To be me, to be Arham Dusta. To be me, to be Yesha Vinod. To be me, to be Joy Barrow. Introducing Envision Glasses, the new AI-powered smart glasses by Envision, empowering the blind and visually impaired to be more independent. Available for pre-order now. Um, so, uh, Derek, sorry, I think we finished time. So great. if you can wrap up a bit. Yeah, that's that's perfect. So I'm right at the end here. Um, I'll just say that uh, there are definite, there are a lot of limitations in using uh, metrics. Uh, Goodhart's law is a, a big one to be aware of, that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Um, and uh, there are, here, here are some kind of ongoing research questions. You know, we're looking at how, how do we generally design AI for well-being? Which metrics should we optimize? How do we translate our values into metrics and what can go wrong? Um, there are some really nice opportunities for using AI to assess well-being. So this is everything from adaptive assessments, uh, like in our, my wellness check or in chatbots, um, as well as sentiment detection within uh, writing, speech, posture, facial expressions. Um, and even though biosensing has been very unfruitful um, for assessing well-being so far, uh, I do think that there are uh, some strong theoretical opportunities that, uh, that I've been exploring. And I'll close with this one. Um, this is more future forward, but being able to link AI and experience, uh, again, the kind of quantified and the qualified. Um, so we've been using uh, convolutional neural networks to predict 
the qualities of musical experiences using high density EEG data, um, uh, specifically the uh, uh, enjoyment and familiarity. Um, and the hypothesis is that neural entrainment can serve as a metric for um, uh, engagement and enjoyment. This is what I was referring to in terms of the whole mindedness uh, theory of flow uh, that when you are fully coupled to your environment, uh, there are uh, resonance processes that may well be observable. Um, and this is a, an active area in the neurosciences now. And um, this is a hard, this is a hard problem, but um, it's been one we've been pursuing uh, in collaboration with a group at uh, IIT uh, in in India. Um, and so this uh, just in, in conclusion here that. Um, I've, I've got a very big interest in the idea of harmony as a general theory of well-being. Uh, it's a very old theory from uh, Confucius and Lao Tzu and Plato, Pythagoras, that there's a notion of harmony in the self and our relationships and society and nature. Um, lay definitions of happiness. So recently, these researchers interviewed some 3,000 different people and found that inner harmony was a major component of how everyday people defined happiness. And since harmony is often defined as um, diversity and unity, um, there are these sort of pre-existing measures of diversity and integration in uh, natural ecosystems and economic markets and social networks. Um, and I think that this frame of harmony, which is a, a quantitative theory, um, brings up some new measurement opportunities. So thanks a ton uh, for listening and um, really, really appreciate the, the opportunity to share. Yeah, thank you. It was a really nice talk. Uh, Arkady, do we still have time for questions or we have to wrap up and close? Well, we still have 16 people out there. So uh, if any of you have uh, questions yeah. and you have time, Derek, and uh, yeah, we can keep going for five minutes or so, I think. I have eventually a question, but I want to give the stage to others if... Yeah, so I, I do have a question, if I may. Uh, I, I found it a very inspiring talk also with all, uh, all the many examples uh, that you gave. And I would like to come back to a, a point that you said at the beginning, uh, or the beginning, well, anyway, uh, about autonomy. Um, so in the end, what is your answer to this, you know, uh, for yourself? To what extent would you go for autonomy? To what extent would you say, no, uh, let's keep it uh, basically like tools, right? Yeah. Tools. yeah very, very strong on the tool side. I, I'm very skeptical of uh, autonomous systems. I think it's much better that we design interfaces between systems uh, and not try to delude ourselves with uh, pure autonomy. Because I, I think it's very rarely the goal. Uh, and so, do you see yourselves as autonomous? Do I see myself as autonomous? Human beings in general, so. Uh, well, in a certain way, yes, and in a certain way, no. I think that uh, our individual personas are uh, more illusory than we often admit. Um, but at the same time, our uh, our desire for, for freedom um, is very deeply ingrained um, and, and indeed necessary for, uh, for us to, to thrive. So I, I, I think there's an important philosophical relationship between autonomy and interdependence um, that uh, a lot of people have talked about in the past that um, when you have differentiated people that are individuals and autonomous, it creates opportunities for interdependence because of the diversity of, of, of individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can understand. Okay, thank you. Luciano, maybe you had a question or no? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I do have a question uh, regarding the yeah. 
first example you gave, uh, so first of all, just thank you for the, the presentation. It was very interesting, very inspiring. And uh, regarding the My Wellness Check platform, you mentioned that the people have like some space to put some um, qualitative data. And I'm just uh, wondering, because you have quite a few thousand people already respond, how, how does this scale up? How can you manually go there? What, what can you do in the information? How do you process this information? Yeah, it's a huge issue. Um, and it's something that uh, uh, started to collaborate with Sepeda, uh, who's been working with Alessandro uh, Bazan um, on some different tax processing approaches. Um, because something like sentiment analysis is not so interesting with it because people are self-reporting uh, their sentiment. Um, but because of that, it allows the, um, the discovery, like the, the basic approach that we've been do using now is, is um, creating, I'll say creating an interface even though it's really just like um, Google Sheets and things like that, but creating an interface for people to explore the experiences that people are having using the quantitative metrics for organization. So the quantitative metrics make it much easier and more informative to explore those experiences. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the goal is really sort of storytelling, um, but it takes quite a bit of, uh, of, of you know, human engagement to make use of. Yeah, I, I can imagine that. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, someone else has questions or uh, I can ask something maybe because it's related to my wellness check. So uh, I was curious because you introduced it as a service, but then for now, as far as I understand, you are collecting data, right? What will it be the service? Yeah. And one question, one question. Uh, I finished. So, what will it be, and is it similar somehow to existing AI um, well, mental health applications? Yeah. Um, so uh, the um, the service has a few different stakeholders, and initially, the primary stakeholder that we were imagining was uh, institutions, institutions and organizations that are no longer able to check in on their people uh, in person. And being able to make sure that everyone's sort of doing okay anonymously uh, was our goal. Um, and so this is everything from um, schools and hospitals and uh, those sorts of things. Um, and so in that sense, it's a service for those organizations to be responsive to the well-being of their people. Um, but, you know, the, all, the, all the data that we have now is from people that are just signing up. And what we're building out is um, some feedback loops where we, first of all, allow people to um, self-assess on particular topics. So, um, you know, take uh, validated assessments on anxiety or loneliness or things like that, um, and then provide uh, existing appropriate mental health resources. Um, and then one other aspect is that we've been gathering from participants their own tips and recommendations for supporting well their own well-being, and then sharing those back out with people um, in the interface. So trying to have a kind of crowdsourced plus AI approach towards uh, community uh, well-being. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or maybe we can wrap it up here since we are a bit out of time. Okay. So thank you very much again, Derek. It was really nice. And I hope to see you next uh, Agora, which I'm not Great. sure who it's going to be. Uh, OK. Yeah, thanks again for the invite and appreciated the, the questions and engagement. Thank you. Uh, bye, Thank all. You. Bye.